all you got to do. <laughs> You're always ready to self-promote. Everybody's always ready to self-promote. God's not in self-promotion. He's in obedience. Amen? So be patient and wait. That's awesome. He's awesome. Please take a seat. So, okay. Now, I, I, I don't know why I do this. For all the years, I, I never, I never, I'm not a joke teller, but I just find these funny things that I just want to share with all of you. And this one was kind of cool because this mama, she goes and she knocks on the door to her, her son's bedroom and she says, honey, it's time to get up to go to church. And he's like, I don't want to go to church. And she goes, you got to go to church. He goes, I don't want to go to church. She says, why? He goes, I'll give you two reasons why I don't want to go to church. I don't like the people there. You've heard your kids say that. I don't like the people there and they don't like me. One, they don't, I don't like them. Two, they don't like me. And the mother says, honey, you're going to church. One, you're 47. Two, you're the pastor. <laughs> you like it? I guess, wait, I got, I got a better one. I, I just, people just call me and tell me these things, right? So this friend of mine calls me in New York last night, and he says, hey, Joe, check this out. There's this older couple, and they're in their mid-70s. And, you know, sometimes when you're in your mid-70s, you can forget all the nice love languages and and. and words of affirmation and touch and all kinds of things, and you forget that. So she goes to bed, and she's laying in bed, and she does what she does every night. She just lays in bed and puts her head on the pillow, and all of a sudden, she feels her husband touch her in the back and her just a big smile over her face, and she's like, oh, man, he hasn't forgot me after all these years. He still, he still loves me and touches me, and, and all, all of a sudden, she feels him touch on the shoulder and just keeps smiling and just curling up to the touch that she's feeling and touch her in the back of the neck, and, and all of a sudden, it stops, and she says honey, why did you stop? He goes, I found the remote. I know my Padre, Espirito Santo. Let's get serious. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, my Lord. All right, listen. This I know, I, I pray that you get a hold of this today and let the blessings of the Lord be yea and amen as I begin to speak this. I want to start with Hebrews chapter 12, verse, it's like in the middle of verse 5 and verse 6. And I love what, I love what it says here. It says, my son, do not take light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. The word chasten means he reprimands them in the area to teach them, to learn, and to train them up. And I sat there and I thought about that and I thought, you know what? The Lord is not a mean God. He disciplines you because he loves you. And sometimes because we don't have a lot of discipline going on, you know, when you don't discipline your children, it, it eventually shows them that you really didn't care that much about them. So God disciplines those he loves and he reprimands you to teach you and to train you and to raise you up so there's perfection in your life because you know nobody likes to hear no when you want to hear yes you want to hear yes but you're hearing no and the authority that's a telling you that's telling you no is trying to protect you you do that with your kids you do that at work you hear it with everybody else but the no is to protect you but you don't hear the reason why you just hear because I said so and that's the title of today's message because I said so what you have to realize is God says no a lot but he doesn't say, because I said so, he gives you 66 books to go find why he said no. So today we're going to just take a portion of this day, and, and I know that this is going to bless you, it's going to ease your mind, because you're going to understand why sometimes he says no. It's not always no, sometimes it's not yet, because there's a process that takes place, and we don't want to hear that, but you got to understand this. Think about this. If a baby's born way too early, it's not really healthy for the baby. If you take a turkey out of the oven before it's done, you're going to get sick. And so is everyone else who eats it with you. Perfection takes time. God's not going to change his mind when it comes there. We feel, here's the kicker right here. We feel, as human beings, we feel we're ready. I'm ready right now. I'm ready, God. I'm, I'm ready. And, and God's saying no, but I'm ready. So sometimes God says no, but we say we're ready. 
And he says, no, and we say, we're ready. And he says, no, and we say, we're ready. And he says, no, and we go, then fine, I'll do it myself. You see what happens? We're ready to get married. We love. We're ready to love. We're ready to go to that new job. We're ready to buy that big house. We're ready to do this car. We're ready to have this. We're ready to have kids. We're ready. To have, we're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. And God's like, easy. Slow down. But I'm ready, God. But, I, but, but God, I'm, I'm ready. You see, your skills are ready. And the love that you have for other people are ready. But you're not always ready to handle the circumstance that comes along the journey. And that's when God says, not yet, because he's got to prepare you for perfection so there's no failure. Somebody say amen. amen. So don't get upset when God says no, and he's not saying because I said so. He says no because he's going to take you on this journey that you may not always be ready for. No matter where you are in life, the procedure and the process is still the same. Stop getting frustrated and understand what's really going on. Now, I'm going to share this with you because it made sense to me when I saw it. How many people, well, I'm not even going to ask you, but there's, there was a movie out back in the 80s called The Karate Kid. And there was a movie, and they made a new one called The Karate Kid with Will Smith's son. So in the movie, uh, little Danielson, or whatever the kid's name was in the second one, I can't remember, but he's going to fight the bad guy. So he's trained by Mr. Miyagi, and Mr. Miyagi's just like, you know, he's a big, like, you know, trainer kind of guy that knows what he's doing. So he's going to train Daniel, and he tells Daniel, this is what you can do. You come to me, I'll teach you, I'll teach you karate. You'll be able to fight in the tournament. I'll teach you. So he comes to him, and this is what he has him doing for, like, days and weeks. He's like, he's got all these old cars, and he's having him wax the cars. He says, you put the wax, he goes, you know, he walks up, Danielson, wax on, wax off. Good, gives him the rag. Every day, come back, wax my car. You waxed it yesterday, wax it again today. Finally, he gets mad at him. He says, listen, I came here so you can teach me karate. You got me waxing your cars. I'm not your slave. This is ridiculous. You're ridiculous. Same way in the karate kid, too. Take the jacket off, put the jacket on. Put the jacket on, take the jacket off, put the jacket on. I'm tired of this. When are you going to teach me the good stuff? When did not? You know that stuff. When are you going to teach me that? You got me waxing your cars. The second movie got me taking jackets off, putting jackets on. So finally he says, whoa, wait a minute. You see, if somebody throws a punch at you, you have to do this to block it. Or you have to do this. Or you have to do this. And you have to do this. But if the movement's not natural to you because you're not willing to train, then you're not going to understand. It's not going to come natural to you. You're going to have to think, and when you think, you're going to overthink, and when you overthink, man, you're going to be dropped just like that. So nobody wants to train. Nobody wants to go through the training process. Everybody wants to get right to the meat. They don't want to wait. They want to take the turkey out early. They want the baby to be born after three months. Nobody wants to just wait and let God do what God said he's going to do. He says he disciplines those he loves, and he chastens those he calls a son. That word means he reprimands you, and he trains you and brings you up so you don't start too early. You're not ready for the job. You're not ready for the marriage you think you're ready for. You're not ready for the things you want until he says it's time because he's not not trying to give you what you want for the moment. He's trying to give you what you want that lasts not only for you, but for the generations that are coming after you, for your children and your children's children, because you're going to grow up one day and you go, I wish I would have taken more time waxing on and waxing off. I wouldn't have had these two black eyes right now. You see what I'm saying? So we have to understand that's how God works. He's not going to change his mind. That's how God is. So, you know, I, I, I'm, this, I can make it personal now with myself. There I was in 1993. I lived in California with my wife. I was in the entertainment industry. And that year was a per peculiar year for me because everything started going really, it seemed to be going well, what I thought was going to be really well. I had a TV series that was promised. I had a movie that was promised. I had the, the, the show that we did for the kids was taken off. The comedy show was great. Wherever we went, it was like people were losing and loving it. And it was just amazing. And, and this, this big preacher tells him, gets, uh, says at this event that my wife was at that he needs a security guard. I'm like, good, tell him to find a security guard. I don't want to do security. I never did it before. I don't even know what I'm doing. So she says, no, God said it's you. Well, it's not me. Why would it be me? Because see, I'm in the entertainment world. I am a star. <laughs> I don't have time for this church stuff. So I put my resume in because my mom and my wife said it. And guess what? There it was, 1993, December the 31st, 11.45 at night, 1993, I get a phone call. My answering machine was broke, but it worked for one person. And the answering machine the person said, I got your resume, and I want to interview you. Now, this, now, he didn't get just a resume. He got a resume from the floor to here. Hundreds of resumes came in. He picks me out of the resume. Okay, so I take the resume. I go meet him. My wife flies back to St. Louis, with, I mean, to Orlando. Where would I live? California. <laughs> <laughs> We fly back from St. Louis to California, and she doesn't even wait for me to have the interview. She packs the house because she knows it's God. So I go get the interview. There it was. I get hired on. 
I'm the security guy. I don't even know what I'm doing. Let me tell you what my job was. It was exciting, right? I am. The, God has taken me from what I thought was what I was supposed to do, and he puts me in a place I have no idea why I'm even there, nor do I even want to be there, and my whole job was this, was to wait for this pastor. Now, he was a worldwide pastor. He knew he was known all over the globe, and so he would pull in his garage when he'd come to work in the morning or when he'd come on a service on Sunday, and my job was to stand there. Watch this now. Stand there. He walked in, I opened the door. I closed the door, I locked the door. That was my job. Open the door, close the door, lock the door. Open the door, close the door, lock the door. Wax on, wax off. Jacket on, jacket off. Close the door, lock the door. Open the door, close the door, lock the door. What are you doing to me? So then I sit in the service. And I'm sitting in the service, and I'm sitting in the front seat, and there's like thousands of people there, and I'm listening to the service. And I'm like, I can do that. I see how he's handling a crowd. I'm the expert. I'm in front of crowds. I'm in front of large crowds. I'm in front of small crowds. I'm in front of the camera. I know how to do interviews. I know how to act, action, just turn me loose. I'm going to go. I'm going to entertain you. It's going to be great. He don't know what he's doing. He'd say a joke. I'm like, I could have made that way funnier than that. You didn't, you didn't build the crowd right there, bud. I could, I'll teach you how to do it if you want. Open the door, shut the door, lock the door. I'm critiquing the man of God because he's not performing like the way I perform. Amen. And I'm saying, he don't know what he's doing. God, if you've taken me with me, let me do it. I'll get up. Let me, let me, I can preach. I love you. Just give me the word. I'll show him how to, I'll show you how to make a crowd laugh. I'll get him cheering and clapping. Not this guy. Then I go to Costa Rica. And I'm in the Costa Rica, and 50,000 people are in the stadium. And I'm sitting on the stage looking out at 50,000 people, and the worship is so beautiful. And it begins, and the people are worshiping God, like what you're supposed to do, by the way. You worship God and worship the music, and not just singing slow songs, but singing songs that adore him. For you are worthy to be praised, and it's beautiful, and it's at a fever pitch. And I said, man, dude, you better pray for these people right now. Pray for them right now. What's wrong with you? I want to get up out of my chair and go whisper in his ear. You don't know what you're doing. You sit down. Let me handle this. Because I'm ready. He stops the music just like that. And he, he puts his head down. And when he lifts up and he says, I'll pray for the people after the service. But if I should do it now, I would grieve the Holy Spirit. Because they would build it on the miracles and not on the word. And I sat there and I went, I'll give him that one. And God says, you're learning. Now keep locking the door. That's all I got to do. Open the door, close the door, lock the door. Open, close, lock. I'm walking through the airport. There's a magazine right there. Two-page interview of muscle and fitness that they did on us before I left. And I'm walking going, you're really cute. I'm carrying suitcases. There it is. Open the door, lock the door. See, I'm ready. I know what I'm doing, God. Trust me with this one. He's like, no, you're not. Lock the door. He's not teaching me unless I lock the door. Amen? He's not teaching me if I abandon the mission and do not let him reprimand me because everybody wants to start before it's time, but nobody wants to lock the door. And nobody wants to wax on. And nobody wants to wax off. Take the jacket on. Take the jacket off. Everybody wants to get out there and do the thing, but nobody wants to take the time to lock the door because he said no right that moment. So you're going to bypass God's no and make a yes happen on your own. Amen? Amen. What's going to happen? The turkey's going to come out. You're going to get sick. No, I waited, and I waited, and a year later, I became the children's pastor. And then 18 years later, he said, now you can start a church. But you see, the journey prepares you for everything that is there for you. You're wanting to do it all before his time. Stop being in a rush and lock the door. Because if you don't know how to do that, then you don't know how to follow him. See, I was saying, but I could do, and God's like, I, I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can, because that's what I created you for. But you don't know how to hear me. So the more you lock the door, the more you watch that man communicate with me. Somebody say amen. Because if you're not communicating with me, then you're not going to understand what I got for you. You're always in a rush. You're always ready to self-promote. Everybody's always ready to self-promote. God's not in self-promotion. He's in obedience. Amen. So be patient and wait. I like that. 
What are you talking about? Let me give you a little Bible for that. You've got Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle was one of the most brilliant men in this time. He was studied under Gamaliel. He knew, he knew the law inside, and he knew the law out. He knew 613 laws. He knew the Bible. He knew the Torah at that time, all the five books of Moses. He could memorize them. He knew everything. On the road to Damascus, he gets a revelation. He gets blinded by, by Jesus, and Jesus says, why do you persecute me, Paul? Don't persecute me. So Paul has now got a different mission in life. He is now to become a, a, a missionary, or as we would call it, a pastor or an evangelist to the Gentiles now, no longer the Jews. He preached in the synagogue. People couldn't wait to hear Paul. He preaching the synagogue. All of a sudden, watch this. Paul gets done. Off. He's blinded for three days. He gets his sight back. Does he get out? Is he, does he promote himself to go preach the word of God? No. He goes back in the synagogue, and the only thing that he said was, Jesus is the son of God. That's all he said. He didn't get to do his mission. He went for three years, and he sought the Holy Spirit. And after three years, he began to preach to the Gentiles. And after that, the church didn't even recognize him and ordain him for another 10 to 13 years. And this is Paul. This is a brilliant man. And we think because we got a revelation from God, it's supposed to happen right now. We think because we went on one date with somebody and they didn't say the, the, the mean thing that the last person said, we're supposed to marry them. And all of a sudden, God's telling us to do No, the answer is no. And it's not because I said so, because he does, he, he does say so. It's in the Word of God. He will give you 66 books to go find why you got to slow down a little bit and let him and not get discouraged. We're always discouraged. Amen. But don't get discouraged. Hold on to the truth because the truth is what sets you free. Amen? I love it, man. I hope, is somebody getting a hold of this right now? Okay. I like that. Now watch this. God prepares you for longevity. And I just want to show you. If, if I could just have Bill and, and Chris and Bruce, can you just come on up here and, and be on your instruments or something here? I want to show you, I want to show you something right now. This is, this is kind of like a, an example. I like to bring everything like three ways to make it work and stick right here in our minds. So come on up here, fellas, and grab this guitar here. I'll, I'll grab the guitar here. Let's see how this thing, whose guitar is this? Yours, Chris, or Bill's? Is this yours, Chris? That's a nice guitar. Let me see that thing. See that thing. Wish I had a pick. I do, thank you. <laughs> That's all you got to do. <laughs> so, you got that guitar working? Come over here. I can't see you. Come stand in the light. There you go, right there. Mr. to Bill. Okay, Bill, watch this. You see, I can play the guitar. I can play any instrument you put in my hand. It doesn't make a difference what it is. I can play it. I'll figure out something, and I'll play it, and I can play it. And you know, the first thing to, a, first thing to an instru instrument are the scales. Notice I didn't even have to look. That's how good I am. What do you got? Give him the guitar. <laughs> Here, trade me guitars. Here, Chris, come and hold this guitar. Give me this thing right here. I got a pick, thank you. Hey, the strap fell off. Hey, I know how to put this strap on, but I figured you could do it better. Can you just make this work? How do you put it on here? Thanks. Trade me picks. What are you personal? Like it's gonna make a difference? You didn't see me ask for a special pick. It's kind of high. How can I look cool? With... <laughs> I'm gonna buy me a pick 'em up truck and take it on the road and get it stuck. All right, now. Okay, did you hear that scale I played? See, I, I know chords too, and I, it doesn't make a difference which pick I use or which guitar I use. Yeah, yeah baby. No, I'll play right now.
What do you got? <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> I'll try this thing. What do you got? <laughs> do your best. There is really, if Jesus were here right now, he would stop his message after that. Because just because I can play the scale doesn't mean I'm ready. Just because I can play a few notes doesn't mean I'm ready to lead in the worship. Just because I can play a few chords doesn't mean I'm ready to go on a concert tour. This is where we fail because we self-promote because we can't take the time to seek God because he said, not yet. Amen. You want your life to be blessed? Slow down. Yeah. Amen? So you have to understand that's how God works. So I, I want to just bring it down, bring this home to the Bible now. I love it. The whole concept is right here in John 15. This is a chapter that every Christian has to get a hold of. John 15, 14 through 17 says this. It says, you are, Jesus is telling this to his apostles. He said, you are my friends, and if you do what I command, I no longer call you servants. I'm going to read the whole thing, then I'm going to explain what it means. Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me. I chose you, and I appointed you to go, that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And, and so that whatever you ask for in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, just love each other. So you say, well, what does that mean, Joe? That sounds pretty simple. But think about this. First of all, Jesus says you're no longer servants. You have to understand the word servant means slave. You're no longer a slave. You're no longer on the outside. He says, I now call you friends. Do you know what friends means? It means I have, I have I've called you a friend. I have watched you. I have watched you lock the door. And when I saw that you locked the door and I knew what you had in you, that you kept locking the door, the wax on, the wax off. He says, then I took you from the world. This is what it means in the Greek. I took you from the world. I removed you from that place of slavery out there. I have put you right next to me, and I have spoken the nuptials over you because now you are my friend, and that which is of my father is now for you. 
What does that mean? He says, I, a nuptials. What is Jesus returning for? Is he returning for people that are gathering socially? Is he returning for, for um, wealthy people? Is he returning for a big business? He's returning for his church. He's returning for his bride. And you're not a bride unless he speaks the nuptials over you. So you say, well, I want to do it now. Wait a minute. You're in test mode. He's watching you lock the door so that he can pull you and that he can speak to you. You're ready to give up because it's not happening the way you want when you want it to happen. So he says this. He says, you did not choose me. I chose you. The word chose means God chose you and he judged you. He, he looked at you. He, 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 he looked at you based on the rest of mankind. And he says, I have asked them to do something. I have asked Joe to leave his place of comfort. Now, I'm not sitting here boasting on myself. I just don't don't have any other examples to use because I don't know all of you. So he said, I'm calling you to leave here what you love and what you desire, and I'm bringing you to a place where I'm going to totally transform and change everything you have ever known into something you have never done before. I said, okay, Lord. So he says, that's what he said. I chose you because I have watched you, and I've, po- and I've plucked you, and I've spoken the nuptials over you so that you can be mine and that I could share everything with you because I did all this so that you can go bear fruit, fruit that will last. You say, well, what does that mean, fruit that will last? I got to go open an orchard now? No, fruit means obtain souls. Your whole life is a Christian. All the joy that you have in Christianity, everything is about obtaining souls. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, I don't want to be a preacher, Joe. I wasn't called to be a preacher. That's not what that means. When you obtain a soul, what do you obtain it with? How do you obtain that soul? When you, have, when you get married, now you've got a wife, and then you're going to have children. What do you do with those souls? Do you lead them the right way, or do you lead them the wrong way? You see, without God, chances are the works, it's not going to work out. So you're going to have to say, I'm going to follow you. Well, how do I follow you? Lock the door. How do I follow you? Wax on. How do I follow you, Lord? Wax off. Put the jacket on, put the jacket off. But I'm tired of doing that. When, when, I'm, when I say you're ready, then I'll choose you. And when I choose you, I'm no longer going to call you slave. I'm going to call you friend. In other words, I'm no longer going to keep secrets from you. I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to sit you right next to me. And I'm going to teach you how to bear fruit. Because when you bear fruit, you obtain souls that will last. And when you obtain souls that will last, it takes your life from right here to right here. What does that mean? Where's that at in the Bible? It says it very simply. You go from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. While the world goes glory. Does that make sense? See, why, why do I get frustrated? Why am I so frustrated? Because when God says no, we, want to, we don't want him to reprimand us. We want to do it on our own. We want to do just what I want to do. No, I'm going back to California. I'm going to take on that, that TV series that is long-ended. I'm going to do that movie. That actor is long forgotten about. I'm going to do what I want to do because at that moment, it's going to make me happy. And God says, but what I got planned for you, what I got planned for you, is going to take you from glory to glory. So no matter what new things change, you're always a glory step above the rest. Is that making sense? Do not get frustrated because you think God said no. And he never said, because I said so. What he actually said was, not yet. I need to train you because I discipline those I love and I reprimand and I teach those who I call a son. You want to be a son of God? Get ready. You're going to do it his way. And those that are watching, maybe for the first time, you're, on, you're watching online and you, you've never been to church. You're like, well, that's the problem with Christians. It's all about control. It's not about control. If, if a man built a Ferrari, you don't take it to a Ford dealership to get fixed. You see, you take it to the one who built you, and the one who built you knows the way out of every cavern that you can get yourself into. And even when you do wrong, he's got a way out. Even when you sin, he'll pull you out of the muck, wash you up, clean you up, and send you back out again. He'll do it as long as you keep locking the door and quit aborting God's mission and starting your own in Jesus' mighty name. If you like that, if you understand that, let's give him a big God bless you. To God be all the glory. That's all I got today. Would you stand to your feet, please? We don't want you to leave today without giving you an opportunity to follow Jesus. The Bible says the only way to the Father is through the Son. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We invite you to take a moment and ask God to forgive you and to help you follow him on this journey. If you've made this decision today, make sure that you get into a church that teaches the Word of God. Remember to read the instruction manual. That's the Bible. If you're in the area, 
come visit us at any time. Check out times and location at orlandofamilychurch.com or at 407-462-1358. Hope to see you there.